writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, we are going to discuss how to make your readers empathize with your characters. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, president of Whiny Trails Media, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, writer of crazy things, and voice actor. Wow, is that a long list. And with us today is my lovely co-host. Hi, my name is Kathleen Kayembe. I write speculative fiction under my own name. You can find my story, The Fairy Tree, out in Lightspeed Magazine, November 1st. And um, I also write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and do freelance editing, and I'm setting up an AWA writing workshop group, and uh, that is my life. Okay, that is her life. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Chanel Achan. I write things about stuff. Um, wow, is that loose? You're as bad as me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I write... Uh, science fiction and fantasy right now i'm going through a literary phase um and i'm also otherwise very very busy with non-writing related stuff mm, unfortunate oh, right. side effect of life Facts. life tends to do that to us and next is my name is jennifer solzer i'm a children's book author and illustrator we if you live in the st louis area i i can say that i will be signing books with three other local authors at Six North Cafe on December the 9th. The last time I mentioned it, it was December the 2nd. We have changed the date. It is December the 9th in the morning, 11 a.m. at Six North Cafe on Clayton Road. So come check us out. I'm Melanie Lucas. I, uh, I have a day job, which is keeping me busy, but I actually got some writing done this week. Great. And I am working on a fantasy novel extremely slowly. <laughs> and I can empathize with you having that certain day job because I watched the hours you put. And I'm reminded of my former day job. I feel sorry. <laughs> but thank you. I'm Victoria. Fedora <laughs> Ames. You're Victoria we, we have now created a brand new nickname, <laughs> a brand new pen name yeah. for our Madame of Murders. She's committed to many murders in her stories, yeah, she's so now she's needing to hide. Fedora Victoria Amos. Well, the something like that. Well, because I write Victorian who done it, so it does kind of make sense as a mistake. Right? <laughs> I work for me. Well, I write Victorian who done it. It's like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And I would like to tell everyone that I just got an offer for my next book with Five Star. It's called Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James. And we're going to kick it around and get a contract before long, I trust. Right. <laughs> so it will be coming over in a year or two, who knows. Congratulations. Congrats. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Also with us today is... My name is George Soroy. I am the president of the Missouri Writers Guild. I am also in author of science fiction for the young adult reader. Uh, my books from Parts Unknown, the complete five-part serial, are available in, uh, in <coughs> and ebook. Uh, also, my YA sci-fi novel, Excelsior, is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. And the, uh, the sequel, Ever Upward Part Two in the Excelsior Journey, is currently being edited, and I swear to my publisher that it will be finished and live before the end of this year. And I am... Also, an audiobook narrator. For more information on that, you can uh, just go to my website, which is he's got it.com. Excellent. And joining us remotely today is the one and only Steampunk Master himself. Ooh, a Steampunk Master. I like it. <laughs> yes, Brad R. Cook, author of the Steampunk uh, trilogy, The Iron Chronicles, and uh, now the middle grade, Steam Tree, which. Uh, Depending upon when this is uh, airing, is either out or about to come out. So, check it out. Great. Excellent. Now, today's episode is going to be about creating character empathy. That 
is to me a interesting game of jump rope because you've got certain situ you got certain genres that lend themselves to being focusing on the iconic aspects of the story. Let me use examples: Star Trek. A lot of superhero stories are out there. Um, a lot of hard-boiled detectives are more along those lines. Um, there are other aspects of it as well. Some of the fantasy, I see. And then you've got got stories that could fall into the same categories I just mentioned, still. And they've got they focus on creating empathy for the character. Um, let me use an example of one that falls into this. The overall view, Batman. If you look at a lot of the Batman stories, it focuses on. Bruce Wayne a little bit, but mostly it's Batman. I am now Batman. Whereas, of course, you got the Christopher Nolan trilogy. Um, you also have the video game done by Telltale, um, which focused more on Bruce Wayne and his character development. So, how do you how do you go approach? How do you begin to approach the decision to, for character empathy, and then how do you create? I'm going to go back to Hard Boiled because I love Ooh. Hard Boiled. Go for it. Most of the Hard Boiled characters, like the PIs in those noir films and books, are kind of uh, callous fellows. They're not very nice and they push all kinds of things. They break the law. They do a lot of rotten things. So it's kind of hard to like them. How do writers, good writers, get around it? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples because it seems to me that they must have standards. They may not be the same standards that everybody else has, but they are standards that they can live by and live with, and we can admire them a bit for that. Take, for example, Jake Giddis in Chinatown. He is not a nice guy and will do just about anything to uh, get to the bottom of things. He'll slap women around, he'll break the law, whatever. And yet, even after the bad guys threaten him to the point of slicing up his nose, he does not quit. He does not quit. Another example I like very much is in <clears throat> The Maltese Falcon, one of my all-time mm -hmm. favorites. And Sam Spade is another PI who is not a nice guy. When his partner dies, he doesn't turn a hair. He really doesn't do anything except to tell the police to stay out of his way and give him some room. Yeah. Well, he's also going to decide when he's going to continue sleeping with his partner's, with his now dead partner's wife. There's that too. <laughs> but when you get down to the nitty gritty, when push comes to shove, and it is the decision to turn the woman he loves into the law or live this life, which is against his standards, he says, it's your partner, and when your partner is killed, you have to pay attention. And so he turns it over. So, having standards, having clear-cut standards, maybe not everybody's standards, but some standards to live by, I think is one key to making characters more likable, more admirable, and more understandable. Okay. Um, in order, because people are wanting to dovetail, myself, Brad, Kathleen, Melanie. Um, real fast, another good examples of what you're talking about using hardball, Spencer and Hawk from, Sp from the Spencer for Hire series. They both have their own codes. Spencer and Hawk are definitely friends. I, I pause there because it's interesting how they define their relationship at times. Because they actually have two separate codes, which just have to walk hand in hand most of the time. And Hawk is pretty much a smart muscle man, like a better way of putting that. He's almost a trained assassin. So with that, Brad, and then... I was just going to throw out a modern example of this kind of empathy building in characters, which is John Wick. <coughs> uh, so Wick is in no way, shape, or form a redeemable character, really, but then they kill his dog and instantly we all feel for the man. And suddenly he's the most empathetic character in the movie, and we root for him now through two whole films where it's just, you know, wholesale killing. I mean, he does have the code as you guys are talking about and stuff like that, 
But the way they really build empathy in Wick is through the death of both his wife and his dog, but really it's the dog. <laughs> okay, Jen. Am I next? I guess. That wasn't the order you said. It wasn't the order, but she just passed it off to you. Passed it to me. Um, I wanted to, I'm kind of changing the topic though. So oh, okay, okay, then so, over yeah, to Melanie okay. and then okay. to you. Well, I was just going to say things about building empathy in characters, something that happens right at the end of the movie, but the, the last scene or the last few scenes of Casablanca really makes you, uh, it resonates and it becomes the classic movie because of both the scene of the getting on the plane and then the very end was um, the whole exchanging of looks about, you know, rounding up the usual suspects and all that. So it's people both breaking their codes and keeping other codes and all that. And looking toward the greater good, mm -hmm. that is. George, since you're dovetailing then over to Jennifer. There's, uh, there's another element actually in Casablanca that, um, that really is basically just makes whatever, what happens at the end really like kind of the exclamation point. And that happens much earlier in, in the movie when Rick is basically asked, you know, like, tell me what, you know, what brought you to Casablanca? And he responds, my health, I came to Casablanca for the waters. Waters? What waters? We're in the desert. I was misinformed. That's it. That's mm -hmm. all he says. That's all he cares to even say to anyone else. And that makes you want to know more about what, you know, like, what he's gone through. Why he would choose to set himself up in that location and do what he does. And so later on, when you, when you get that great flashback, what you're doing is, you know, like, you're giving him his moment to just kind of ponder on it. But he's still not giving anyone else satisfaction of knowing what is going on. He is just simply brewing on that, and they're letting us in, but no other characters, other than the ones that are directly involved, would know that. So that makes that creates like a great exclamation point right at the end. So backstory, as he said, it's very important. Mm -hmm. But it was funny too, and humor is endearing to people, mm -hmm. especially those who can be can have self-deprecating kind of humor that will create empathy for the character if it can if he or she can do that i'm going to nail this topic down by its heart to the board okay. uh, there's a difference between Ignore empathy, the blood. No, empathy and sympathy uh -huh. there's a big difference between that empathy is the ability to feel with a character and sympathy is the ability to feel for a character there are plenty of characters and stories that we feel for but <laughs> Fostering empathy is such an art because you have to not only put together a scenario in which someone says, oh, well, I want that guy to succeed, but you have to do it in such a way that you see yourself in that person and you want to succeed with them. Right. The, you, want, you have empathy for a character because you feel with them through their authenticity and through their... Uh, approachability, not necessarily through what they're doing, what they've done. Uh, it's a, a great example that I, I've read for the difference between, you know, you, do you want a character who is altruistic and good and does everything right, or do you want a character that is driven? An, a sympathetic character is someone that you're like, oh no, he had, you know, the Brad Pitt's character in World War Z. You have sympathy for that character. You don't have empathy for that mm -hmm. character. Because you're watching this and it's like, oh, he has a family. Oh, and his family's in danger. Oh, that's so sad. But who is he? You don't know who he is. You can't feel with him because he's got no depth. There's no character to him. You can feel for him because you don't like watching a guy suffer from diseases he randomly stabs himself with. Um, if the only thing that you can empathize with is that you both like Pepsi, that's not much to work with. Versus someone like Walter White from Breaking Bad, he does a lot of bad stuff. Yep. He's no one that you want to emulate in real life, I hope. I hope you're not trying to emulate Walter White. But you if you do, you might have a problem with the cops, just put it there. But, but you empathize with him because you understand him. And because you can feel his passion and how driven he is and the reasons why he's doing what he's doing and why he feels the way he feels. And you are then invited to feel that way about that too. 
not because you are also a meth cooker, but because you are a human being. And you understand that human beings feel certain ways. You have also felt sad. You have also felt ho hopeless. You've also felt trapped. And you're seeing someone rise above that, and you want him to succeed because you also want to succeed. And not, you can't get everybody, like, I mean, you can't expect everyone in the world to empathize with every character. So we make a lot of different kinds of characters. Get some empathy for people. And I'm a great example of this. The way that you get me addicted to your story, you give me a character I can staple myself to and I will ride him the whole way through. I become uh, addicted to one or two people, three or four people if you've written a really good show, and I go, I watch the show to watch my favorite character and my relationships are based on that character's relationships within the cast. Does he love this guy? I love that guy too, man. He's my bro because he's my character's bro because my character is the one who has earned me this show. So not that's an example to set. Not to mention any show titles. Go <coughs> back on five. Any show title, honestly. <coughs> hey, I give example in this room. Mr. Brad R. Cook. He's written a trilogy about sci uh, steampunk airship. And boy, did I become addicted to Captain Balder. <laughs> well, thank you. He was he is my favorite. And I was, uh, when I'm drawing, I drew fan art for his book series because I was in love with him. And I was in love with the fact that he had this loyal crew. And he was like the dad to Alexander, who's the main character. And you get to watch Alexander struggle with you know his own father, who he feels is oppressive. And then this super cool guy with a lightning cannon that is like, I would like him to be my dad. And it's... Um, that's a di that made me interested in him, in, in the whole world, and the whole ship, and that was because I was able to understand everyone based around an empathetic connection I made with the character. So there you go. I am so glad I let you go first, because that is exactly what I wanted to pin down. Mm -hmm. um, the definition in uh, dictionary.com is, for the word empathy, is the psychological identification with or vicarious experiencing of the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. And what I think we've kind of touched on so far is we've touched on how to make a character who is not likable still interesting or um, characters you can admire without necessarily agreeing with. But empathy is the ability to put yourself in that character's shoes and really identify with them and what is going on in their life. So even if you don't necessarily agree with their choices, you still understand them and you feel for them and you know why they did it. Do you still have yours? Um, yeah, just to add on to what uh, what Jen was talking about before about you know creating you know real empathetic characters. Immediately, one that really comes to mind is one that's been covered here you know a few times already in previous episodes, which is Rocky Balboa, mm -hmm. because he's somebody who has gone through just a, you know a life not getting that sort of shot and basically just kind of coasting through life trying to do whatever he can to get by and that's what so many people deal with in their own lives and then all of a sudden he gets this this chance out of nowhere to basically just improve himself in in a way that he never thought possible and it's something that we all yearn for. It's some, so it's something that we're going to kind of go on this ride and see, like, if this guy can can get to where he believes is the top of the mountain, then we all can. And then at the same time, we're introduced to other characters that are fascinating in their own way, especially, um, especially the character of Pauly, because he's somebody who never had that sort of shot, is also kind of coasting through life, but has also become very embittered about his situation. And that's something that we can all basically just kind of identify with at the same time. It's very much a, I don't want to be like that. I want to be more like this guy. <coughs> and that just kind of, that becomes so much, of a, so much of a driving force in that film, in that whole series, basically, as we watch him go through this, uh, this amazing progression. Well, Rocky is an excellent example of how you foster empathy with a character mm -hmm. because he's uh, he's a generally good guy like we, we understand that he's the good guy but he's also not a perfect guy right he's kind of dumb uh, he's kind of a brute 
Mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't had this opportunity yet because he's just a little bit on the lazy end. And he turns it down when he first when it's first. Yeah, it's like he's him. afraid. He has doubt. But these are things that humans have. Yeah. And by putting that in there, that creates a character that's real enough. This is a, a quote that I just heard recently um, uh, from Sylvester Stallone. Mm -hmm. He said that he misses Rocky. He yeah. misses being Rocky because when Sylvester Stallone says something, you know, he's quoting, saying, using himself in third person. Mm -hmm. When I say something, uh, it's, you know, it's like people are wondering about, you know, my motivation. But when Rocky says something, you know it's he's the saying the truth. Yeah. Because the character of Rocky is one that is an honest man who's trying his best. And by building a character that, I mean, obviously Sly understands him through and through so much that he misses him like a person. Yeah. Uh, the... But the, to under like to build him, it's not just what he's done and the choices he makes. It's watching him cope. It's understanding him and feeling with him. And because he's such a strong character, we follow him through. What are they up to? Seven movies, including Creed. Uh, eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight, seven eight, now. Creed? Seven now with with Creed. Yeah. And then he's working on Creed two right so, now. So so they're up to eight movies, and we can't say what happens to him in the eighth movie. But like this, we had not yeah. come out yet. They're making it. Right. But um, the. We watch, we follow that character through his entire life, like to the mm -hmm. point of being terminally ill. And we understand him the whole way because he's a real person, he's a real character. We follow him through the, the robot butler side plot. Yeah. Well, that's, that's always been like a really fascinating <laughs> thing because like you get that, that arc with three and four where, where he's goofy. basically just like a, you know, almost like a superhuman type of character. And you know that it's not going to last, and he knows it's not going to last. And because he's real. Yeah. Like my, my, I'm going to use the word real, because it's, that's real for me it embodies the concept of authenticity and of imbuing a character with a soul, and that's when you have empathy with a character. You can invent, you know, there are any number of, uh, of prize fight style boxing guys that started from nowhere and rose to the top. Uh, if your movie has the emotional resonance of a good game of punch out, <laughs> then hmm. it's not quite the same as watching someone do something. And like David brought up before, not every movie requires you right. to be as plugged in on a character, but with Rocky, it's named after Rocky. We're watching his story, and so therefore us being drawn into him is the important part. The, the fights are interesting and fun. They, but they play into his character story versus if you're just watching, you know, a, a fighting movie. It might be uh, you're you want to you, you pick out which character you want to to win and you focus on and you want him to win, but really you're there to watch the fighting and you have to understand what your movie or your book is about. Well, about and that. it's and it's and it's interesting when you see, when you think of like that uh, the fourth one, uh, which w was like the epitome of all of all of the you know like the excess and everything like the. Um, wound up being the highest grossing out of all of them, and so also because it's the shortest one out of all of them as well. <laughs> so they were able to fit in more more movie well, times. Also, very very quick, I wanted to throw in the fact that even though we've got like this sort of a lunkhead and we follow him through again mm -hmm. the robot butler plot, yeah. it gets a little weird. We still cry for him in five. Yes, like breaks your heart. Yeah, and that's because we feel for him. That's the empathy. Mm -hmm. It's when he comes out and he starts crying because of Adrian. We understand. Yeah. I, I can go on for hours on, on the series, but I'm sure you know, like... Yeah, we're oh, monopolizing. Yeah. Monopolizing, <laughs> I apologize. Kathleen and then Fedora. Um, so, since you're bringing up examples of characters that, uh, and, and uh, things that do a good job of creating character empathy, I wanted to bring up a couple things. Um, Ted Chang, in his book Stories of Your Life and Others, um, has a short story called Story of Your Life. And it's a short story that the film Arrival was based on. Mm. And when I read that short story, knowing that the film was coming out, I was like, how can anyone possibly adapt this to film? Because it is a short story about a woman who begins to experience time differently after learning an alien language. Mm -hmm. That is, that is the, the plot. But the story itself, the emotional core, is this woman's relationship with her daughter. Mm -hmm. And... I felt such empathy for this character. It was just engendered such powerful emotion in me, and I thought, there is no way a big budget film is going to be able to capture this. And Arrival actually managed to create an almost equal level of empathy in me 
for the main character. And they did that by creating this relationship she had with her daughter. And because that core stayed the same, even though the way that they did the plot changed, even though some of the things about the characters changed, I still understood this woman. I knew who she was at her core. And so I cared about her. I cared about what happened to her and I cared about the world as a result. Um, so I thought that did a great job. And, and like I said, it's a, it's a story and it's a film, so you can watch both or you can whatever. And, <laughs> and you'll get to see a way that like film can do it well and a story can do it well. Um, something else that created, that just enthralled me. Um, I'm black. I'm supposed to like Beyonce. That's just, <laughs> that's just the way it is. But until these last two albums that she's done, Beyonce, what is it, Beyonce or Beyonce 4 or something? And, um, Did she self-title And uh, Lemonade, these last two albums. Before those, I was like, she's whatever. And then I listened to these last two albums, and I hadn't realized that a song could make me feel so much for a person. Mm -hmm. Because the albums tell the story of a woman who is in love with someone and then is cheated on and then has to deal with all of the emotion that goes with that and then reconciles. It's an entire character arc, basically. And when I started listening to these albums, I was like, yeah, I hate that guy. Why would he do this? Oh my gosh, I so feel where you're coming from. I have never been cheated on. I was in her shoes, though. The entire album not just with the music, which does a lot to engender emotion in people, but with the lyrics as well. The entire storytelling situation worked. So I just wanted to point out that it's possible to, to build character empathy in music, not just in story, not just in film, not just in TV. And finally, I wanted to point out that romance as a genre does this very well. Okay. One of the things that you just mentioned, betrayal, is an important way, I think, to get empathy. Because we all feel we have been betrayed in some way, small, large, whatever. And that is a, a very good way to do it. I would like to uh, give you a little advice, which comes from Ray Bradbury. He says, give your character compulsion and turn him loose. <laughs> and that is advice for writers. Mm -hmm. What I think he really meant was, Give your character something he wants so desperately that he can't think of life without having it, or at least pursuing it. In other words, he yearns for something. That that is a key because all of us want something. Anne Lamott says that every character should want something on every page, even if it's only a glass of water. What should they yearn for? Well, perhaps these are some possibilities. Yearn for self, yearn for identity, yearn for a place in the universe, yearn to connect to other people. I have my own heroine, Jemima McBussell, do exactly that. She wants to be her own person. She wants to determine her own future, to have a career that interests her, and that's very difficult for a young woman in 1898 St. Louis. So she has plenty of obstacles to stop her at that. But it's the yearning that we can all identify with, I think. Mm -hmm. Jen, and then Kathleen. Uh, oh, you're, you're dovetailing it so Oh, I was, I'm going to jump in real fast on a thing that Kathleen said a little bit earlier. Okay. Do you have something that goes directly to what the door just said? Okay. Yeah, Kathleen. go ahead. I'm just going to say, um, <coughs> I figured out that romance is a genre as good as engendering character empathy, but it's because they want you generally to identify with the characters who are going to fall in love and to understand where they're coming from so the love story makes sense. And we all want to connect with other people. We yes. all want love, mm -hmm. as you said. So one of the foundations of romance then is basically what Fedora said, the, the desire to connect. So, I mean, if you want to find out how to make people empathize with characters, check out some good romance. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're tying in involved romance because I wanted to point out that romance as a genre being great for empathizing with characters uh, is for a variety of reasons. One, that's the goal because the whole concept of the genre is emotional. You want to fall in love with both of the lovers and want them to fall in love with each other. Like, that's all emotion. And uh, you can tell people they're in love, but now we're at 
Star Wars Attack of the Clones territory. They're beautiful and they smile a lot. They must be in love. It was like, did you feel the love they but had? But can they? Sorry. Yeah, like, there was, uh, uh, that's one of the main complaints about that second movie, is that the love story is so stagnant. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it wasn't emphasizing trying to get us to empathize with the characters. Uh, Anakin's speech about sand, while hilarious, is not really something that gets your uh, your emotions tied to him. You just feel like he's a whiner. And he's trying his best to be honest, but he's just not written well enough to feel like a character who's vulnerable. Uh, mostly, uh, I'm not going to get into Star the Star Wars prequels because we've beaten those to death, but it has a lot to do with the fact that the focus of the movies was on lightsaber fights and action pieces and I would have argued that maybe the love story should have taken place off camera <laughs> because you got to understand what animal you're writing here um, but the the emotion bit of romance uh, it doesn't it has to do with and, and also with what Fedora mentioned it, it doesn't have to do necessarily just with what your character does or is it's it's understanding why they're doing that it goes just a layer deeper than saying, ah, well, and this is a, a, common, a common sin of writers, uh, comic book writers, movie writers, people who don't have a lot of time to get their stuff done. Uh, oh, well, he has a tragic backstory. And they just lay out, oh, well, he watched his whole day family die in a fire. And it's like, oh, well, I instantly care about him because this terrible thing happened to him. No, seeing how he reacts to the fact that his family died in a fire. That's what gets us empathy. If he is saying, yeah, my family died in a fire, and then he makes a joke about it, we've learned a lot about that character. And if that joke is betraying a hidden sadness, now we have empathy. Mm -hmm. If he's saying a joke about his family dying in a fire and he has no emotional reaction at all, uh, now we know that he's an asshole. Or a psychopath. Uh, or a psychopath, and we have a hard time <laughs> connecting to him. And so he's, we've, we have, uh, we have, we've, amputated a portion of his empathetic options there. It, it's, that's, it's watching characters react and having us understand why they're reacting it and drawing that conclusion ourselves. You know, when I'm saying understand, I don't mean, you know, his family died in a fire writing down on the page. His family died in a fire and he felt sad because that was a bad thing that happened to him and he loved his mother. It's like, you don't have to explain it to us. We know that we don't like losing loved ones. Everyone has that in common. Uh, but let us watch him feel sad about it through his actions and through how he responds and behaves to other people and situations. And then as we draw those conclusions ourselves, we feel invested in him because we have participated in his sadness. Kathleen and then George. I am so pleased you brought up emotion and vulnerability. I was looking forward to this topic. Yes. <laughs> um, like... Jens just said, you can give the character all the tragic backstory you want, but how they feel about it is what's going to make the reader either feel empathy for them or feel distance from them. And um, Brene Brown has a wonderful TED talk on the power of vulnerability. And when she was standing up there, she made herself vulnerable and I cared about her mm -hmm. as she was talking about not just her research, but her life and how it has touched her. And that TED talk is one of the classics. And I think it's because she was willing to be vulnerable on a stage mm -hmm. full of an audience of people she didn't know. I cared about her in a way that I don't necessarily care about all the people that stand up and give TED Talks. Mm -hmm. Because she put herself out there. She allowed us, or me at least as a viewer, to feel for her. And characters who are willing to, to feel things and to be vulnerable, if not with the people around them, but with, you know, whatever perspective you're reading the story in. Those are the characters that you are able to care about because they give you something to care about. They give you their motivation for whatever actions they're doing and the reasoning behind it. One of the reasons that Civil War, the Marvel Civil War film, which I'm looking at uh, David's shirt, He's rocking the Marvel swag today. Okay, so. <laughs> He's got a shirt with Iron Man and Captain America duking it out, and it says Civil War. And one of the reasons I hope to never see that film again was because it did its job too well. I understood Captain America's perspective. I understood Iron Man's perspective. I wanted to shake them 
and make them sit down and talk to each other, but I don't get nice things. So instead they punched it out and every punch was painful because I understood and I felt for Iron Man. I mean, if some guy killed my parents and it emotionally scarred me for life, and then I literally had to relive that just two weeks ago for a presentation, mm -hmm. and I found out that my best friend was hiding that guy from me, I would want to punch him too. I would want to punch him so hard, and if he defended that guy, I would want to punch them both out. Meanwhile, if I were Captain America, and I knew my friend was innocent of this crime that he had committed, because of super traumatic brainwashing and literally did not even remember it, I'd be like, don't hurt my friend. Mm -hmm. This is my friend. He, he re He's sorry. He just, no, don't hurt my friend. And I would defend him. So on both sides of the line in that film, I was feeling punches and I was feeling hurt for both parties and it was the worst thing ever and you I'm got, never watching it again. You it got double much. punched. Every punch hit both of you. Which <laughs> coincidentally is a fun thing to play with as far as playing with psionics in, in, uh, in writing. Mm -hmm. Feeling everything from every perspective. Um, which actually, Octavia Butler has a character like that who feels mm. the pain of other characters in her book Parable of the Talents and Parable of the Sower. And it's super bad for her when she gets in fights because she's a tremendously willful character and you are with her 100% and then someone gets shot and she is out and you're like, oh no, what is going to happen to her? Empathy. It's empathy for that character and the guy who got shot you have no idea about so you don't feel so bad for him even though he's the one who's got the physical and a lot of tension because she lives in a world where they have to fight to defend themselves and if she is anywhere near this and sees it happen she is down she is down when uh, when Jen was talking about um, characters that all the, that you all of a sudden find out about you know like how their family died in a fire or mm -hmm. something and, and how that is um, that can in a way like you know create you know some sympathy and everything for that particular character. It can also work in a negative fashion because there are there are cases where those those types of tragic backstories are basically just kind of tacked on right. just to just for the simple point of trying to add some more sympathy to a character. Um, William Goldman d uh, talks about this in great detail. When um, for when he was talking when he was working on uh, the movie The Ghost in the Darkness with Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer, uh, Michael Douglas's character was originally going to be just like a very, uh, supporting character, just very much like in the shadows. He was going to be a support mechanism for Val Kilmer, but he w really wasn't going to be a major element in there. He was going to be just like the guiding force. And when Michael Douglas came in and w acted as producer. And the star, he wa he was kind of insisting on adding elements that would kind of deepen his character, and so Goldman basically just felt like he was forced to go in and, and write this paragraph that a whole other character basically just talks about Michael Douglas's character, saying how he lost everything, and it basically just it felt so inauthentic, yeah. like artificial, yeah, and it just didn't work at all. And one of the things that you real that um, I'll 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 move on to like a, a different point later, but that was something that um, can definitely play against um, your story. You can't just add in sympathy for the sake of adding sympathy. Mm -hmm. There has to be something more to it. There has to be something more organic to it. Well, you also run the risk of alienating your audience, who has then you've lost their suspension of disbelief because you just added one too many things. Yeah. <laughs> Are you dovetail or changing? Sort of. Don't, okay. Dovetail in. It's, it sort of feeds into what you've been talking about. It is the uh, the plight of the underdog. Mm -hmm. We all feel as though we have been, you know, uh, dissed from time to time or not gotten our due, not gotten our just rewards, and we're not really equal to the tasks that are set for us. But you have the Hobbit. Mm. Poor guy, does he's not even human. But all of the same, we empathize with him because he has a task that is just too big for a little hobbit to do, and yet he somehow manages to do it. Um, Kelly Link calls that the one down situation, where um, just humans are generally want to 
um, sympathize and to root for the person who starts out in, you know, in a situation where they're the underdog, where mm -hmm. they're down on their luck. Um, one of the reasons Cinderella is still a classic and there are versions of Cinderella in cultures all over the world is that this is someone that we can sympathize with at the very least. I mean, she used to be a person in a house and she got turned into a servant through extremely unfair circumstances. We want justice for her. And when she finally gets a happy ending, we're like, yes, yes, girl. Well, Cinderella is a great uh, sort of, of little pocket lesson on the difference between empathy and sympathy. Because Cinderella as a character is great for sympathy. And her whole story through all of her, you know, these centuries of spoken, you know, folktale has all been about sympathy because she's got no character. <laughs> and if you've seen yeah. recent retellings of Cinderella, the goal of every single one of them is to find a way to get empathy for Cinderella. Um, you know, we've got, you know, Ever After was about her character and trying to and turn her into a little bit of a sassy pants because we wanted to identify her as a person so we could connect with her so we would have empathy. Um, uh, the, I just saw a, a version of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella on stage, and they introduced an entire political subplot to try and foster empathy for Cinderella because she became a tiny little political rebel in in her um, her royal like s sabotage or something, and and it was complicated. And the only part I remember is that there was a giant mantis monster in it for some reason. <laughs> but that, it's, it, that's the lesson between sympathy and empathy. Like, we feel about her. Yeah, we, we know what it's like to be downtrodden and how nice it is that someone gets a reward for being a good person. Or at least being an inoffensive shell of a person. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't... Uh, we can identify with that to a point. And that's still identifying with it, because what's still us trying to see ourselves in a position like that. But empathy is about the character, the character being a person that we then feel with and for. So there's my lesson right there. Um, Go ahead, and then I've well, got something. I think that that's, that's the common thing that people try to do in retelling fairy tales in the modern day, because fairy tales and folk, folklore generally is not about characters, mm -hmm. it's about types. And in the modern day, we want to feel for characters. So you have to flesh out these people who are, who are only types in these stories. Which leads to my question, unless, Mel, you wanted to dovetail? Yeah, I want to dovetail the, just want to point out, uh, Sabrina, and not the Teenage Witch. <laughs> uh, they made a movie about it, and they remade the movie about it, but that's pretty much the story of Cinderella, where they gave Cinderella a very distinctive character. Mm -hmm. So, Sabrina, and it was, in this case, she wasn't really downtrodden, she was just the child of the butler, you know, and she married the master of the house. You know. You're taking us someplace else, so let me just throw something really fast that I want to come back to, is talking about taking a character's backstory and mirroring that into their current story, creating sympathy, or not creating sympathy, but empathy. So go ahead, and then I'll do what gets back yeah, to that. Yeah, question. Well, um, because we're talking about sympathy versus empathy, mm -hmm. what are some good ways to create character empathy rather than leaving it at sympathy? How do you guys create empathetic characters and the authenticity that Jen is talking about? Well, I'm going to avoid mine. I'm, you, since you threw that open, I'll throw this one example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is actually a translated novel. It's originally written in Spanish. This is the American title. And by the way... If you go on Netflix, they did make a movie out of the first of a trilogy, and it follows the first book extremely closely. It's called The Invisible Guardian, and it's written by Dolores Run, Run, ah, there goes my Spanish, Rodono, Rodondo, R-E-D-O-N-D-O. -O. It is a story about a Spanish woman who is a... Um, police detective who has gone through the FBI's um, behavioral, science, uh, behavioral um, analysis unit to learn how to do profiling. And she's dealing with a case of serial killer, of a serial killer 
running around her former hometown, which she doesn't live in anymore, killing young women. Now, how is that sympathetic? As a child, when she was living at home, she was abused and almost beaten to death by her mother. And there is a connection to this whole story between that story and what's happening with the serial killers. I don't want to go into it too far without giving everything away. But it, there's, you go back and forth. You keep seeing how she has flashbacks. She has flashbacks. Not so much it's a flashback in the story, but it's a traumatic event flashback she's going back to as she's also dealing with, up with the current murders and how she's being questioned even by her own family of why are you even here type aspect. I'm going to leave that alone at that point. Just throwing out as an example. Fedora, then Jen, and I need to get back to Brad. Yeah, Brad's been sitting patient for like. Well, Brad's been Brad. There we go. Brad's finally got a text to me. Mm -hmm. Answer for Kathleen. So, Kat, so Brad does have some. So, Fedora, Kat, Jen, Brad. One of the things that makes characters both empathetic and important and interesting is that they have a struggle. Take mm -hmm. Hamlet for example. One of the most complex and interesting characters ever written by anybody. He has a hideous struggle and there is no good way that he's going to come out of this at all. He finally has to make a decision but what is intriguing to us is the fact that he has to think about it, that he struggles with it. Another similar character is Antigone who also has a great struggle. She can bury her brother and get killed for it or she can not and be damned forever. Neither is a good choice. But it's watching her struggle that creates the interest. Jen? Uh, the question was, how do you, how create. Do you create these characters? Mm -hmm. uh, and to move, uh, to get empathy instead of sympathy. Uh, I'm going to reorder that. I think it's a process of moving from sympathy to empathy. Hmm. Start with sympathy. What are they going through? Nail the thing that is a tangible thing. Their family died in a fire. That's a sympathetic character note. And it's good to have sympathy for characters. You can go overboard by writing a whole paragraph about it. <laughs> uh, but that's because the paragraph and the event itself, uh, they aren't as important as the empathy portion. You take your sympathy, your character's died in a fire, and move that into empathy by letting that affect the character you're looking at. You, When you're writing that character, when he, you're writing your, your pro tag and you know that he his family died in a fire, then everything he does, don't forget that he had that trauma as a child. And as he's moving through his life, dealing with the fact that he's an orphan because he watched his family burn up, then you know that when he hears about people who have had house fires, then his immediate thought is, oh my gosh, what they lose. And you know that if a family is in danger, that he might put more stakes into going in to save that last member of that family because he knows what it's like to lose a member of a family. Mm -hmm. And watching him do that makes us feel for him, gives us the empathy we're looking for, uh, not only, again, because he experienced the house fire, but because we have been able to experience it with him. We have been able to take that knowledge and then understand him and participate with him and anticipate his responses, like Fedora's been saying. It's the struggle, it's how the character deals with the thing that gives us the empathy. Brad, and then George. Uh, first, I totally uh, agree with the start with the sympathy and then move to empathy, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually gonna say two things. So first off, uh, understand that you are going to write tropes uh, because everybody has a tragic backstory. Um, <laughs> They may not have died, it may have been some other tragic backstory, but everyone's gonna have a tragic backstory. It's about how you use that moving forward and everything that's really going to determine uh, whether or not it is a cliche trope or you've used a trope in kind of a, in a good way. But the way that I truly, and to answer Kathy's question, how do I do it, um, is by understanding that each of these people is a character themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, in Jen's case with my book, uh, she's talking about the crew of the ship, which are technically all side characters. Uh, they're all NPCs in a role-playing game, so to speak. 
and yet they all have a uh, they each have their own backstory. They each have their own tragic tale in their lives that has uh, aimed them at where they're at. And so by understanding that they're all real people, uh, kind of naturally you're going to build in that 3D character. And when you do, uh, hopefully empathy will come with that because they're real, genuine people. George and then Kathleen? I uh, just wanted to bring a little something back to what you had said before when you were asking about um, incorporating someone's backstory into their main story. Mm -hmm. A really good example, and this is some, and uh, this was this was for a, a movie that unfortunately like needs more attention now than than ever, mm -hmm. uh, which is the 1976 film Network. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of my, I, I would I would strongly say it's the perfect screenplay, and it's also easily in my top three list of all time favorite films. Uh, but basically, like, what the great way to look at, at uh, how to incorporate backstory into a character's main story is to look at William Holden's character, Max Schumacher. He is somebody who has been spending, you know, the past couple of decades at that time through the golden age of television. He's been working in the, in the news division. He's been doing all these different things. He constantly talks about doing a remote uh, story at the uh, at the middle of the George Washington Bridge while it was under construction. And it's something that he holds on to and says this story a few times throughout the uh, throughout the movie to different people. And the main crux of the story of the movie itself is seeing new the whole news division being shifted in a way that he is not comfortable with to a point where he becomes just as self-destructive to himself, to his marriage, as he believes the whole news department is as a whole. And it's a fascinating look at, you know, and everything, just kind of looking as you watch his character go down these, go down this hole that he winds up going, going down under, uh, into, and eventually try to, you know, kind of realize that he is gotten himself into a place where he can still crawl himself out while the whole division as a whole is too far gone. So it's a really fascinating way to kind of just uh, not only get some empathy and everything for that character because he's been able, you, you know his experience as you get to know him and you get to see along with him that this is not a good direction that this whole network is going into, and it's going to be very dangerous in the future. Kathleen, um, I'm going to do Fedora for closing, closing thoughts. Well, I want to point out someone in this room who, uh, who read it open mic the other week and completely changed my way of thinking when I did not want it to be changed, Chanel. <laughs> so, Chanel writes beautiful lyrical stories. And um, Chanel also has had some experiences in her life with people that I want to beat to death with frying pans. Okay. And I am a verbally, I will tell, I will say violent things about people. I will never do it. But in this case, I kind of want to sick some people on this person. I do not want to like them. I do not want to understand them. I do not want to know how other people can like and understand them because I am closed minded and angry. Mm -hmm. And Chanel managed to take pieces of her experience with that person and put them into fiction in such a way that I completely understood why someone would want that person in their life. I was like, wow, this person's actually pretty cool. I understand why the narrator wants someone like that in their life. I completely understand. I get it. I would too in that situation. And it was really good, but I also wanted to hurt her because that was a thing. I did not want empathy for that person. I did not want to understand that situation. So something that I found from good writing is that you can feel empathy for even people that you don't want to feel for. That is what good writing can do for you. Um, I actually did a little thought experiment with someone I was mad at and thought was completely unreasonable once, and I tried writing a story from their perspective 
about a situation that was similar to the one that was making me so frustrated in my life. And I came out of that story on the other side being like, well, damn, now I can't be mad at him anymore. Because I get it. I still disagree, but I get it. Wow. To those who mean well. So, I mean, like, as a writer, your job is to be able to empathize with all sorts of people, whether you want to or not. And if you can really get inside someone's head and think about things from their perspective and try to feel the way that they feel, then you can convey that on the page because you are able to feel that same thing. And you can create empathy in readers for that same person, that same situation that you may not feel, that you may not like, but that you understand. And that's something that's wonderful about writing that you can do. It is also comparative. Take, for example, Captain Jack Sparrow. Now, he's not much, let's all face it, as a human being. And yet, he's better than the rest of them around him. So by comparison, he really is a more empathetic character. But what I wanted to mention was that writers can have their characters do something admirable. Because all of us have high aspirations. We want to do something admirable. And there is a book, it is called Save the Cat. Brad, who wrote Save the Cat? Oh, uh, I don't know. Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that is something I think every writer should read. <laughs> <Remember it. laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, C. David Mills actually did a, uh, a whole um, class on Save the Cat in, at the uh, Missouri Writers Guild Conference this past May. Oh. And so that was the... Uh, the name of the writer? Not the name of the writer, oh, but okay. he, he, is, uh, he uses the... No, no one wrote Save the Cat. It, it grew out of the ground for the benefit of writers. <laughs> it's a yeah. classic screenwriting well, book, getting so, so, so it, I bet. I'm literally looking at Blake Snyder. Yeah, yeah, yeah Blake Snyder. Yeah, yeah. Blake Snyder. I'm looking at it over in my head. I know it exists. <laughs> All right. And on that note, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. And go save the cat. Save the cat. <laughs> I feel for you. Pumpkin agrees. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Writers, agents, and publishers. For the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture